evening and welcome to another episode of What's So Funny, the show that probes the minds, the brains, the psyches of the people who make the funny. Tonight, we're in Las Vegas, Nevada, talking to one half of the Shecky Magazine dynamic duo, the male half. Brian McKim and I sat down a few weeks ago in his new hometown to talk about the magazine, comedy controversies, last comic standing, he told a few jokes, oh, and a whole lot more. Hey, if you're new to this podcast, or even if you aren't, why not head over to iTunes and give us a rating? That would be mighty big of you. And, and while you're at it, you can check in on the other 239-odd episodes that we have there. If you, you know, you probably haven't listened to all of them, they're good. All right, enough with the ado. Let's get on with the show and Brian McKim. We're coming to you live from Hooters in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> Hooters Casino Hotel. Oh, okay, Hooters Casino. Yeah, we're not actually in the restaurant. Uh, but Brian I, Brian McKim is our guest, the uh, co-editor, the co-creator, CEO. What's your title? Of? I'm the co-creator, editor, and publisher of CheckyMagazine.com. Right. For all your stand-up comedy Ooh. information and needs. You're an expert. The, the World Wide Web's most beloved magazine about stand-up comedy, as we like to say. Uh, uh, just a little bit exaggerating. <laughs> do you uh, do you consider yourself an expert? I, I mean, I know the lamestream media considers you one, I mean, and that's yes. no knock on you. But I mean, no. they, you're the go-to guy, right? Just in fact, I just did a, a lengthy uh, interview with um, uh, Smart Money Magazine just the other day. I have 33 minutes on the phone. Uh, the fella uh, searched all over the web for some sort of authoritative. Uh, uh, website on stand-up comedy, and he said all arrows pointed to us, which is nice. Nice to hear. And yeah. Uh, what was, was the What was the take? If you can give us a little. Uh, oh, he preview. just was. He was. Uh, they have a little thing called Play Money. Uh, it's a little feature where uh, I guess what they do is they talk about uh, investing in things that are interesting or you know fascinating, and and, and w- he fi- he fixated on opening a comedy club. So he's asking me all kinds of uh, questions about you know investing in a comedy club. Uh, I was able to help him out, I suppose. A lot of it was conjecture, but, you know, there was some right. solid you, info you, in there. <laughs> I guess uh, you're a businessman to a certain degree, being a self-employed stand-up comic, but you're not a, a club owner. No, I'm not a club owner. Thank God. I, I would not have the stomach for it, nor do I have the, the money for it. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible business person. There's a, terrible. There's a comedy, stand-up comedy. Well, how long have we been in the boom? The boom, the boom. The boom, well, the boom started in uh, early 80s, and then, yeah, and then, and then, and then it died a horrible bust. death in like 92, 3, 92, 93, 4. And then uh, w- we sort of, uh, we declared that it was back again probably about 05 or 04. So I'd say we're in, a, we're in about a, a five or six year cycle of, um, of up. Do, do you predict a constant upward trend? I, what here, I, here's what I think. I think essentially the, the business has matured. And the business has leveled off, and it's sort of like solidified and stabilized. And all the people who are in it now are going to be in it for a while, in the long haul. Whereas before, I think there was volatility because there was people who were sort of like in it just because it was the trendy thing to do and because it was easier. But when the tough got going, uh, a lot of people, uh, the, when the going got tough, rather, a lot of the people just, you know, they turned their, they turned their comedy club back into a titty bar, or, you know, and, and, right. and, and, and retreated. As, as he says from Hooters. <laughs> but, uh, now, as an expert, has your status changed in the community because you are, uh, you know, you're looked up to by the other comics? Are you, you were once just an equal, and now you're this guy that everybody wants to impress. It's, an, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. No, I, it, it is weird. We, <laughs> we're so oblivious that we don't even pick up on that. If there is any kind of oddness or weirdness going on, we don't even pick up on it. And then, you know... Hours or days later, we'll say, you know, maybe he was a little odd because of the magazine. It's only been 12 years that we've been doing this. Right. <laughs> uh, but I don't think there's a. In fact, I can't tell you how many times we'll encounter somebody and we ask them, you know, we, we mention the magazine and they, and they, 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 they have no idea about the magazine. Oh, they're, really? they're a comedian. And sometimes they'll feign ignorance of the magazine, which is right, right, right. And then minutes later, they'll quote something from the magazine <laughs> to us. So it's like kind of, whoa, what's going on here? But no, I don't, I don't, I don't consider us. We have, a, we have, we have no idea. In fact, a friend of ours, Tom Ryan, he encountered us once at Gotham up in New York City and back about four or five years ago. And uh, 
we were telling him that, you know, we really don't think we have any influence on the business. And he looked at us. He used to write for us. He was a right, one of our right, I remember. And he said, you guys have no idea. So that's been one of our catchphrases around the house. Like, you have no idea. You know, <laughs> we, we like to think we have influence. But if we don't, it's no big deal. It's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been fascinating. Uh, talking about the, the uh, magazine piece that you were just interviewed for. That no doubt it'll come out and you'll lambaste it as you like to do with the media, right? <laughs> well, well no, what, no. what does the media get wrong and what does the media get right about? But I think about this guy, comedy. This guy was pretty good, and he spoke to uh, he spoke to Mark Ridley at Comedy Castle in Detroit, and he spoke to uh, Chris Bazzilli up at Gotham, and those guys are straight shooters, and those guys they are very much uh, on the same wavelength as us. So I have no doubt that those guys set him straight, set the author straight. But you know, the authors. No, no offense, but journalists, I, hell, I was a journalist once. Journalists tend to sort of, I don't know, sometimes they get things wrong, and sometimes they sort of, they have an agenda going into the article, and so they'll shape and they'll mold everything that they get into what they want, and, you know, or they'll leave out little details, and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, well, I think, I hope, uh, I hope he gets it right, I think he will. In this case, it's business, so it's, it's really not, it's, it's really not going to be that crucial if he gets anything wrong, you know. What do you think it is? Do you think it's laziness? Do you think it's, uh, they have an agenda that they want to, you know, they have preconceived notions that they're just going to get across, no matter what the subject says in the interview? It's, <laughs> they amaze me, because they continually come up with different ways to jam it up. They come up with all kinds, laziness, an agenda, uh, stupidity. Uh, uh, you know, not listening, not recording it. Sometimes they don't record it, oh. or they'll take bad notes, or, or you know, or they'll attribute a quote from somebody else to me, or my quote to somebody else. In other words, it's like they 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 astound me with the ways in which they manage to mangle the information or put it together, assemble it in a wacky way that so that it doesn't make sense or that it's like off. And then there are the preconceived notions. One of your personal pet peeves is that. All come on, all comics are damaged goods. Yeah, I know, I know. We we uh, we get into that all the time, uh, and I hear it constantly. You know, every once in a while we think about giving up. <laughs> we think, you know, maybe we are all jammed up. Maybe we're all stupid. Maybe we're all uh, ignorant and boorish. And well, I don't think anyone horrible. has suggested that. <laughs> yeah, stand up comics so are are in, more intelligent than the average person. Pulitzer Prize winner Tom Shales said. All comics are monkeys. That's a direct quote. <laughs> All comics are monkeys. So Tom Shales, Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize. All comics are monkeys. I use that as like the prime example. Like, okay, right. game's over. Now Tom Shales is a is or was a television critic, right? Uh, yes, yes, te- yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And and have you ever seen him? He's got a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah, there is a problem, and I think maybe it stems from a lot of people, a lot of journalists. You know, everybody's an expert in comedy, right? Because it is oh, subjective. Yeah. Oh, sure. The audience member sits comedian. there and goes, that guy is not exactly. funny. Exactly. And, and they're entitled to that. I mean, what the heck? That's our job, to, to deal with those experts in the audience and try to swing them around our way of thinking. And more, the, or more often than not, we're successful, and everybody goes home happy. Mm-hmm. But it, it is it is rough because, like you said, everybody everybody thinks they're a comedian, and so you're right away you're going you're you're, you're working out of a out of a hole. You're working at a deficit up there because everybody in the audience, not everybody, but most people in the audience, you know, they think they're pretty they think they're pretty funny too. So it's kind of oh jeez, you got to deal with that. I like how you guys at Shecky don't judge different styles of comedy. No. Whether it's prop comics, ventriloquists. Right. Uh, well, is there any... You have your own personal taste, but you just don't use it in the publication. No, right, yeah. We keep our, we keep our personal opinions pretty much to ourselves, but overall, I mean, we're a non-judgmental. We, you know, it's like, hey, you know... In fact, did you know we have a book coming out, right? Yeah, Yeah, I oh, knew yeah. that. I was going to get to that. And, and the, um, uh, that's one of the things of the book. It's, uh, it's really weird because... We talk about ventriloquists, and we talk about impressionists, and we talk about all, uh, guitar acts. And we just tell the reader, essentially, we, we try to sum up the book. We say, the book is basically, we tell the reader that he can do anything he wants. He, can do, he, doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to do anything. And he can do anything he wants to do. And so it's kind of like wide open. We are like real hands off. The reader, meaning somebody who wants to get into comedy, what's the... I mean, the uh, book. The, I mean, anybody who, re- who we tell, the, in the book, we tell the, the reader of the book yeah. that they can do comedy. They, however they want to approach comedy, 
God bless you. Go for it. Right. In other words, we don't tell them to do this or do that or writing exercises or anything like that. You know, we're very like. That's what I was getting. Is it a how-to book for comics or, mm-hmm. or is new comics? It's essentially, so who, it's a, what is it? It's like it's the most uh, it's the most uh, it's the most zen um, uh, how-to book ever written because we really don't tell you how to do it, and so it's kind of weird. I, I, can't, I, I we put ourselves in the in the in the in the shoes of the person reading it who wants to try stand-up. And like after they get the, the, they put the book down. They say, "All right, now what the fuck do I do?" <laughs> and I think that's the best way to approach it, because you know we don't want to stifle anybody. We don't want to send anybody down the road to, to to political humor or or to magic or anything like that. We you know if somebody can come up with a way of combining Larry the Cable Guy with Amazing Jonathan and George Carlin, go for it. You know, mm-hmm. so we don't want to. Yeah. Wanna, it, the problem with with stereotyping different acts is that there are exceptions galore. Like, Certainly, you yes. know, you hate musical comedy, but oh, we love Garfunkel and Oates or right, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. And I'll tell you what: since coming out here to, to Las Vegas, we've had the we've had the extreme pleasure of watching Carrot Top live at the. Luxor. I heard he does a great show. Oh man, it is a tremendous show, and I I tell you what. I mean, you know, we went into it with an open mind, as we always do, uh, whenever we see anybody, mm-hmm. uh, and um, we were we were very impressed. With and he's a nice guy too. So you went uh, with an open mind, but preconceived notions as to what it might be. Did you not like him in the past? Oh no, no. I actually, in my dark days, way, way, way long ago, before I be- became the, you know, before we started Shecky, I was I was somewhat bitter. I would admit it. You know, the business was going down the dumper. Uh, uh, I was having trouble finding work as a comedian. We were actually virtually out of the business for a while, and we were in radio for for a brief period. So, uh, I, you know, I will admit that I I, I expressed my uh, discontent and I, I lashed out and I I sort of uh, you know uh, uh, said said nasty things about various acts and whatnot. But I think it was only you know, it was only I was just it was it was it was bitterness and it was jealousy and that kind of thing. But. I righted the ship, and, and in, by by the time '99 came around, we were like we were placid, and we were we were live and let live, and we developed this philosophy, this Shecky philosophy, and we were like, you know, let's just let's just give everybody a shot, and let's just you know live and let live, let's everybody be a, a one happy uh, community, and as long as you're not stealing, uh, or as long as you're not uh, you know um, a, a total hack, uh, then uh, you know you're giving an honest shot, then you're 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 one of us. That's right. Now you say we. we, we I don't can't remember if you mentioned the other half, Tracy Skeen, your That's wife, right. uh, stand up comic. Wife. Uh, yeah. Now, now you say you guys developed this. Now I'm married. We don't agree on everything. How do, are there uh, disagreements where you hash it out and you go, this is our yeah, stance. This yeah. is going to be our stance. Right. In fact, that's the, that's the process by which we post. We'll get a, we'll get a, a link in, in the email or whatever, or we'll find something on the web, and we'll start to talk about it. And we'll immediately be, like, you know, <laughs> inflamed about it. And uh, uh, quite often there will be, like, uh, there will be agreement usually, but there will be certain, certain uh, disagreements about various details of the whole thing. And what we'll do is we'll talk about it, and I'll bring up, I'll bring up the, the, you know, I'll bring up the screen, uh, the posting thing, and I'll start typing away, bang, 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 bang. I'll read it to her, and she'll say, no, I don't agree. And she'll change it. We'll change it, you know, and we'll, we'll work on it. So every post, almost every post, is, is a collaboration between the two of us. And we, we, uh, we, 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 ha- we thrash it pretty good before we put it up there. Yeah. And, and hearing you talk about issues, you know, you're a congenial guy. And sometimes you, you read the post and you get into it with some of the readers, don't you? <laughs> Yes, like, you I, included. <laughs> yeah, you, you bastard. You, you were shitting on us for something. I forget what it was. I forget too. <laughs> yeah. I, not, I can't believe try. I can't let's believe just, I was shitting on you. Let's not let's not try to remember what it was. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. no, I can't okay. remember. You do. <laughs> no, but it's funny. Um, yeah, we go into it. If we, it's the power of the written word, right? I yeah, mean, if yeah. we we're sitting here talking about whatever it issue it is. Yeah, we, we would do. disagree, we would yeah, laugh, we would whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I always try to, you know, I, I get into it with lots of people, trust me. Oh, yeah, I, right? I imagine so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you always just try to remember that it is a different medium than if you're sitting around talking, and you cannot possibly go, I hate that guy, Yeah, no, based oh, no. on the writing. And it's a funny thing, too, because we were waiting in line. This is before we moved to Vegas. This is a long time ago, like about, about a year and a half, two years ago. And we were um, uh, we were uh, waiting to uh, 
check into a flight out of Vegas back home. And uh, the fella behind us, he says, excuse me, he says, are you uh, Brian McKim and Tracy Skeen? We said, yeah. And he says, I'm Ryan Stout. And it was Ryan Stout who's a comedian. He was in town, too, working somewhere. We don't know where. And uh, I was like, oh. Uh, we shook hands. And we were, he says, I, I read the magazine all the time. You know, you guys are great, blah, blah, blah. And we said, oh. And we recognized the name because Ryan, I mean, he is one of the guys that we have gone hammer and tongs with back and forth in the comments <laughs> with. And he, I mean, it's just like. If, if people knew that we encountered each other, they probably thought that like there'd be an explosion. <laughs> right, right. But it was it was congenial. It was wonderful. It was fine. And he's a nice guy. And and he from time to time he will comment, and uh, and we'll go right back at him. You know. But it's all you know. It's all in it's all in, in fun and and uh, it's just airing out all this crap. I don't think right. prior to this nobody's maybe done not this all kind of in thing. fun. No, not maybe, no, maybe not in fun. Yeah. No, it's rather passionate and everything. But it is. Let's put it this way. It's healthy. It's good. It's and everybody knows. That there's no ill will, and everybody knows that we're just like, you know, we're opinionated, you're opinionated, hey, let's go at it. It's an honest exchange of ideas. Exactly. Right. Uh, they're just stupid if they disagree with you. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> um, they're brainless. So, <laughs> now, there's a, you know, it's one place, checkymagazine.com is the one place people go when there's something, oh, juicy in the news. <laughs> yeah. Tracy Morgan recently. Oh, geez, Have yeah. you written about that yet? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it's a funny thing. We we sort of like left it alone for a while. Once in a while, we'll do that. We'll either be too busy, and we'll like we'll leave it alone until we can get to it, or we'll like sort of like intentionally lay off it because we know that it'll sort of the story will develop uh, over a period of a, a day or two or three news cycles. And uh, don't you know that Tracy Morgan thing was weird because we kind of found out that it was kind of like Tracy Morgan sort of got caught up in the gears of a political movement thing, and it wasn't so much that he said anything offensive and a bunch of people were pissed off as much as Wanda Sykes and Glad and a couple other people were mad about what was going on in Tennessee and uh, with regard to uh, some sort of anti-discrimination law. Uh, and they essentially used this Tracy Morgan performance and this kid's fo- posting on Facebook. Uh, they used that as a sort of a fulcrum to sort of like grind their axe with the legislators in Tennessee. So we sort of like we took the angle we took the we took the view that it was weird you know Tracy Morgan I'm sure has done that bit oh sure one way or another in yeah. every city in the, in the union but when he came to Tennessee when he came to Nashville uh, Wanda Sykes and Glad and a couple other people took it as an opportunity to essentially just let the let the world know let the country know that they were unhappy with with the law that had just passed. Didn't it start with uh, somebody in the audience, and then he Facebooked it, and they were just outraged? Right, right. a kid named Kevin. Uh, Kevin, I can't remember his name. Yeah, and and I think it's interesting to note that there's no video, there's no audio. There's only this kid and his ah. account of what went on, and then there's a couple of other sketchy accounts here and there. The Advocate ran a huge interview with a lesbian couple that was in the audience. And they said they were terrified and that they were, they were afraid to go to their car. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> this is horse manure. And it's, it's, and it's terrible. I think, it, I think it, like we said, we think it has a chilling effect on free expression. Yeah, I agree. If you, it's kind of like what we are talking about, the way you get into it with some readers, the written word. If you read those words that he said and you have no idea about stand-up comedy, sure, it sounds horrible. Right, yes. But you got to think in your head he's just up there being outrageous same and thing with guy earl yeah we're gonna get to that <laughs> um, so but now are you a little disappointed that tracy morgan apologized you know what oh, a couple very much so you know we in fact when the whole when our fir- in our first posting we said we know what's going to happen they're going to extract an apology out of him there's going to be a you know there's going to be money changing hands there's going to be some sort of symbolic uh, uh demoralizing and humiliating tableau that he has to participate in and don't you know it's all unfolding just as we predicted it would unfold and it's it's kind of disappointing to witness yeah i had the opportunity to interview him a couple weeks before really he was crazy oh yeah he's uh, totally insane yeah yeah and, and and the great quotes were i don't care i don't care what people think walk out you know i say what i want to say exactly and then well, like two weeks later yeah, right. i'm sorry i shouldn't have said that yeah, right. Well, that's terrible to bring a man like that down. It's a funny thing. You know, we were backstage at the Opie and Anthony um, uh, concert in uh, Philadelphia way back uh, a few years back when um, uh, Bill Burr went on his, oh, that's his, his right. infamous tirade, and Tracy Morgan was on that bill. 
and Tracy Morgan was backstage. And it was crazy because, oh, there was everybody, Don Moran, Tracy Morgan, all those guys, the O&A crew. And they had, they had, it was really weird. This giant green room was, was there. And backed up to a loading dock was this truck that served as a bar. And it was a tequila bar. And there was some crazy stuff going on backstage. And a lot of the crazy stuff was centered around Tracy Morgan. <laughs> do you want to be more specific? No, I do not. Okay. <laughs> but Tracy, he's, he's a certifiable, you know, he's a, he's a crazy man. So uh, yeah. I have no, uh, you know, I, but, but that's what you do. That's why you pay $86 in Nashville to go to the Ryman Auditorium and see Cra- Tracy Morgan. Right. Because he's going to say crazy shit. And this is no judgment on his act, which I personally don't think is all that funny, and it's irrelevant, right? Right, exactly. It's, it's irrelevant, totally irrelevant. And, you know, like I said, there's no audio, no video, so... Now, which that brings us to the Guy Earl case, which you mentioned, the uh, famous uh, Vancouver case, went to the Human Rights Tribunal, and he uh, was ordered to pay, I don't know, how 70000 or something. Yeah, I think it's small, smaller sum than that, but still, yeah, yeah. still a, 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 too much. Now, here's the a question I have. Much. A dollar. I, I don't know if, I, you know, I, I, I'm from Vancouver. I go out, cover the comedy scene. I never saw a guy or perform, so no. I cannot speak from any personal it's, knowledge it's of It's irrelevant. <laughs> well, yeah, but here's the question, because I don't know that... And I may be m- mistaken on this, but I don't know that he ever ma- has made any money from comedy in his life. So he's an amateur, right? Anyone. I could get up and do comedy. Now, at what point do you get to say you're a comedian? The minute you hop up on that stage. Really? And, and attempt it, yeah. So, I so so Joe Blow over there, stinking drunk, hops up on a stage and, and spews some uh, vitriol. Yeah. And that's freedom of speech? That's okay? I think so, yeah. Yeah? yeah it's art. You know, it's... it's, uh, it's uh, it's it's con- it's context. Everything is context, man. Yeah. Yeah. And and Guy Earl was doing it a lot. He was doing it. Who cares if he was getting paid or not? Who cares if he was getting paid in beer or blowjobs or whatever? True. Right. He's uh, you know, he's doing it. He's making an honest attempt at doing it. He was emceeing, I believe, at the time. You know, go into the details, but it's like it's all like, oh, that that. W- <laughs> I'll tell you what. That probably set the record for. The number of comments on the on the site. Oh, that was good reading. Undoubtedly, oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh man, because you know I, I see both sides. I ultimately side with you, Brian, on this. Oh well, that's a good um, to hear. But it is it is tricky. Oh, it's tricky. All right. Oh, yeah. we we never for well, actually, I was going to say we never once we never once conceded that it wasn't tricky. Oh no no no. I think we pretty much said no. This is not tricky. This is pretty much cut and dried. Oh. Uh, but it is there. Are, there are nuances, but I think overall, when all is said and done, the thing we were most upset at was this branch of the government, this bureaucratic thing, this 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 loose cannon thing that was essentially persecuting a private citizen for things that he said in a club in the uh, role of a stand-up comic. That's right. the thing that really. Uh, I think the, some extenuating gears. circumstances are that he didn't testify. His lawyer quit. Yeah, and so they didn't hear his side really. Right. And so at that point, should they just say, "Well, we can't render an, a, a decision because they <laughs> didn't do it"? Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good or do they go, that. "Well, we have to go on the information we did get"? Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, like I said, I think the whole thing was a travesty from the start. I think if you can go to a body like that, and you can file some sort of a complaint, and you can get somebody into that kind of trouble where they have to expend time and energy and money defend themselves against something that never should have gone to any kind of a trial in the first place. I think that's just, just bad. Yeah, the argument I have is that no matter what you think of what he said, I can't see that as a human rights violation. No, not at all. I know. And I, I, right, nobody has a right to be nobody has a right not to be offended. No, let me say that again. Nobody, nobody has a right. <laughs> there's not a lot to of negatives a, in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Three nobody negatives. So that right. makes what? No, that makes a negative too. No one has a right <laughs> to essentially not be offended. And so, well, kinda, well, yeah. I mean, that's where do you draw the line? Because you could be offended at any, almost any act anywhere along the way. Exactly. And exactly, so, exactly. And in fact, one of the things we had in our back pocket. <laughs> Should anybody start to really give us flack about this Tracy Morgan thing was the YouTube video of 
uh, remember the Bill Hicks thing where Bill Hicks got, uh, they failed to show that one Bill Hicks set on Letterman? Yes. And then they showed the Bill Hicks set on Letterman? Well, I reviewed that video the other day. And in it, he uh, proposes, well, he says, oh, I gotta, I gotta, uh, I've got a show coming up on CBS in the fall. It's going to be great. And it's a reality show. And he, he says, in it, he, he rather graphically describes placing a gun, a shotgun, in Billy Ray Cyrus's mouth and pulling the trigger. Yeah. So I thought to myself, well, gee, has he created a climate of fear among Billy Ray Cyrus fans yeah. or Billy Ray Cyrus impersonators or country music fans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, no, this is not a civil rights issue. This is Bill Hicks being Bill Hicks. And that was Tracy Morgan being Tracy Morgan. Well, I mean, you could argue that's why they pulled the, the segment from the, the show, right? right? From well, Letterman, we, we, right? We said at the time. Although they did air it we said at just the time a year he or so was, ago. You're, you're, yeah, but now you're getting into context. We said at the time it was right of them, not at the time of the airing, or not airing, at the time of the re-airing or the yeah. airing of the first time, we said it was right of them to have pulled that because I don't think that's an appropriate set for a late-night television show. Yeah, no, I wouldn't disagree with that. You would? I wouldn't. Oh, you wouldn't, okay. Yeah. Uh, I won't go so far as to say I agree with it, but I wouldn't disagree with it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How's that for fencing? <laughs> but so, uh, so you know, we thought it was offensive, but we thought because of the context, he could say that at a club. Sure. In fact, he did say it at a club repeatedly. In fact, I used to do a bit long before Bill Hicks <laughs> did it about. Uh, I used to do a bit. It was uh, shortly after. In fact, we could date it. It was shortly after Belushi died and Holden, Bill Holden died. Uh, actor, you know, Oscar yeah, William actor, Holden. Yeah. yeah. And um, I used to do a bit. I said, all oh, these great stars are dying. Why can't it be somebody like John Davidson? And I said, <laughs> we should hunt him down and kill him. And I said that, that was back when I was edgy. Yeah, yeah. But I thought to myself, ah, oh, Jesus, you know, I could, be, I, I could be subject to some sort of, you know, uh, you know prosecution or whatever. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a crazy business you got there, you know? Like, it is, <laughs> it's not consistent. No. It's, uh, I guess, whoever is more famous is going to get in the bigger trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what you're saying is I was obscure, so it was no problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, is part of it sort that of ratting is, that, out that somebody of that every oh, yeah. that is looked up upon? Sure enough, yeah. I mean, well, they had to go for the big fish in order to grind their axe in Tennessee. So Tracy Morgan was this big, fat fish, playing at the Ryman, 86 bucks a ticket, packed house, bam. And then, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, fodder. What are some of the other controversies over the years that have uh, created a, a, a big s dust up on the site? I don't know. I I, uh, I tend to like uh, think about them for a while and then move on. You know, oh, we yeah? forget about them. Yeah, I, I, I you I, don't lay awake at night. No, I don't. Swearing I don't have a list of grievances. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you. It was funny earlier. You said uh, comedy has matured. It's <laughs> just tonight. I, wa I saw you at the Dirty Joke Show. <laughs> Sitting around telling dirty jokes. Actually, it's an interesting uh, concept, and I, 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 I really like it. And I learned something about myself and about comedians, and that is the first time I was called upon to do it, there was a fallout, and somebody, you know, they needed somebody. So I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot, and I studied uh, jokes and whatnot. I don't really tell jokes. Yeah, most tell. comics don't tell street no. jokes. And uh, it's a skill, and that's what I found out. It's a skill. It's a very specialized skill to tell a joke, and it's really weird telling someone else's material. Not someone else. You know, all these street jokes, they're of, of uncertain origin, and it's pretty much, we're pretty much assured that a lot of these street jokes do not have a contemporary uh, author. In other words, so we're not stealing material, essentially. We're doing old, what they call street jokes. So, um, so variations on something that had been written yeah, before. Yeah, you know, a lot of these probably have their origins in vaudeville. They've just been updated and modernized. Uh, so they're, because some of them may be as much as 100 years old. But it's a fascinating thing. It's not easy to tell a joke joke. And that's what I found out. And now I found out that through doing this show, and I've done it about a dozen times now. And we'll just describe it quickly. It's four guys oh, it's sitting four on guys stage. Oh, uh, three guys sitting on stage. Usually three guys. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, 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 the pretense is that it's the back. It's like right behind the stage door of a comedy club. We've just finished doing our show, and now we're just sitting backstage and shooting the breeze and telling jokes. And the audience loves it because they get to see three uh, professional comedians essentially 
telling, uh, interacting with each other and telling jokes and having a good time. And they love the jokes and they love the interaction and it's fun. Yeah, yeah. But I've learned uh, a, a thing or two about telling jokes. And I've sort of uh, I've honed my skills as far as telling old jokes is concerned. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a whole different animal from going up on stage and doing your own stand-up. Do you give your own spin to them? No. <laughs> no well, just well, actually, no. Verbatim. Yeah. No, no, I do. I give my own spin, certainly, because, you know, a lot of the jokes, you'll, you'll find them online or you'll find them in a book, and they'll be written in a very stilted way. It'll right. be a very stilted language. It'll be like, so then the gentleman says, <laughs> you know, in an angry tone, and I'm not going to tell that way. I'm going to say, so then the fucker says, hey. You know, it'll be like, I'll do it. So I'll do it my own way, in my own vernacular, my own, with my own voice, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I do, I do spin it my own way. Yeah. And, and you, you just look for the dirty ones? It is the dirty joke it show. It is the after dirty all. joke show, yes. But I, I, I must say, I do tell a couple of jokes that aren't all that. The, the, the golf joke, that's not really all that dirty. That's very tame. That's the golf like, joke, now you're going to have to tell it to us. Uh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very like Playboy 1962. I love yeah, those. Yeah. The joke uh, pages in Playboy are awesome. The two, you want me to tell it? Yes. Okay. Two guys are golfing, and they want to just get a quick 18 holes in. And so uh, they go out on the course, and uh, the party in front of them, two women, are playing very slowly. And uh, so uh, uh, like they put up with this for like two, three holes, and then eventually they go, all right, look, somebody's got to go down there and tell these gals to speed it up a little. So the one guy goes, and he gets halfway there, and he stops, he turns around, he comes back. He says, what happened? He says, well, you'll never believe this, but one of them is my wife, and the other one's my girlfriend. He goes, all right. He goes, well, I'll go down. So the next hole, the guy goes down. He gets halfway. He stops. He turns around. He comes back. He says, what happened? He says, small world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, I love yeah. that punchline because it's two yeah. words, and it's really it's compact. It's concise. <laughs> Bam. Yeah. Quite often, it's the, it's the character, the nature of the punchline that makes it even right. funny. Like that other one I did about the, um, the, the ducks and the chickens and the... The, the guy walking down the street. The guy. I'll yeah, tell you, no, you got the guy, it. <laughs> the guy's looking at the looking out his window. He sees a guy walking down the street with, with chicken wire. He goes, "What are you doing?" He goes, uh, "I got chicken wire. I'm gonna go catch some chickens." He goes, "You asshole! You don't catch chickens with chicken wire." Two hours later, the guy's walking the other way down the street. He's got a bunch of chickens behind him. Oh, how about that? Next day, he looks out his window, sees a guy walking down the street, which has got duct tape under his arm. He goes, "What are you doing?" He goes, "I'm gonna go catch me some ducks." He goes, "You asshole! You don't catch ducks with duct tape." Two hours later, he looks out the window. Guy's walking down the street, got a bunch of ducks. Next day, guy looks out his window, sees a guy with something under his arm. He goes, what are you doing? Hey, what do you got under your arm? He goes, pussy willow. He goes, I'll get my hat. <laughs> now, see? Yeah. <laughs> I'll get my hat. I you love know, that. <laughs> I, for, as a kid, I would read joke books. I could never remember a joke. I know. That's the thing. Yeah. They're hard to Some remember. Some people just are hardwired to remember. Uh, and I remember another thing. Always when you were a kid, jokes always traveled in packs for some reason. They would be like associated in some way or another because of the subject matter or whatever, but they always traveled in packs. So if somebody told a joke, they would always tell like two or three because they were always clumped together. And I think it's because somebody's dad or somebody went to a casino and saw a comedian tell the jokes and he remembered them and told them. And I, or, or somebody did them on TV or whatever, mm -hmm. but, or they were in Playboy or whatever. But I, it's really weird. They always clumped around. And they always yeah, tell. interesting. You know, the only one that I can really remember, the late, great Erwin Barker told me. Great oh, Erwin Barker, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Two Jewish guys walking down the street. They Sorry. pass a church. Sign says, convert to Catholicism, get $50. <laughs> one guy turns to the other and says, hang on, I'm going to go inside. Comes out half an hour later. His buddy says, so did you get the 50 bucks? And he goes, is that all you people think about? <laughs> You use well, that at the next dirty joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not dirty, but it's good. Yeah, okay. It's concise. Now, I your like act, uh, <laughs> you know, the average listener might uh, know you best from Last Comic Standing. Yeah. You got your big network. Uh, network, primetime network TV, baby. That how many was, weeks? How many weeks of what? Were you on? Oh, uh, they did a package piece on us, I think, the second or third episode from New York when we auditioned in New York and that was nice they shot a bunch of B-roll and they talked to us and stuff like that and they, they lashed it together and it was really nice and then when I went to Glendale I think on episode 5 or 6 and did the semifinals I was on that one so we're really on only two episodes out of the whole thing right. but it had a it had a pretty good impact and it was like we all like we like to say it sort of made us relevant again because we got a we got another TV shot. We hadn't had a TV shot in 17 years. What was the last one? The one last one prior was probably a VH1 production called 
um, um, uh, uh, Fools for Love, which we taped. We, our lives were in disarray. We taped it in New York City. I think we hadn't moved back east yet, or we had just moved back east and retreated from L.A. when the business was going down the dumper. And uh, we taped this Fools for Love up in New York, and it was a dismal, dismal failure uh, for us. And I think the show was a... I, I, I don't want to say it was a dismal failure, but the show, I, didn't think, I don't think it got renewed. It was on, I think, VH1 for one season. So that was kind of like, oh, this is a fitting end to our comedy career. <laughs> and uh, and it, was, uh, it was just kind of, like, disappointing... But this was a great experience, oh, though, right? Oh, tremendous experience. We went up there March 22nd, a year ago, and uh, we went up to uh, New York City at Gotham, a wonderful club, and auditioned in the morning in front of Andy and the late, great uh, Greg Geraldo and Natasha, and uh, we both got through the evening showcase. The evening showcase was packed to the rafters. About 30 comics went on, maybe more, 35, um, and it was just a tremendous, delirious experience. Yeah, a bit of a and, rush, I guess. Oh, Tremendous, and um, and then uh, Glendale was a strange experience. They had forty, I think, forty three uh, comedians, semi finalists, and they put us up in uh, two nights, two successive nights, at the theater there in Glendale, and it was just uh, a weird thing. Also, it was odd. I went out first, night number two. I went out first, which was, of course, a direct message. From the producers that they didn't want me to advance. You know, you put them out first. Ah. So there's no drawing of, uh, yeah. they just say you're going out first. Yeah. You got bullet. Yeah, I took the bullet, and, um, but I killed. I had a tremendous set. In fact, the set was so great that when they edited the show and cut it up and showed it, I went on last. So that was a bit of a mind fuck because you go, oh, you're watching. You don't know what's going to happen. You're watching, you're watching, you're watching. You're watching. You go, oh, did they cut me out? And then, boom, they put me on last. So it looked like I closed the whole thing. But uh, it was weird. That was fun. Were you sitting at home waiting, going, when am I coming on? Yes. Oh, yeah. We were biting they their cut nails me out. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Because that you, can happen, right? Yeah, it there can. There are comics that oh, go it there. Happened. Oh, it yeah. Oh, it happened to Joe List. Uh, Joe List was there. Um, uh, there was a, two or three or four acts uh, that, uh, that we were there. I saw them. I touched them. I talked to them. And then... Nowhere Zoom. to be seen. They were disappeared through right. the magic of editing. No trace. Right. Uh, we, we knew they were there, so we would say, oh, there he is, there he is. But uh, no, they didn't appear. Now, you, you had your uh, issues with Last Comic Standing in previous seasons. Yes, we did. And then you went on. They said, we have to quiet this guy. We're <laughs> yeah. going to put him on. <laughs> now, see, that's the, that's the real cynical view. Yeah. That well, they, they, know, they put us journalist. on there just to <laughs> shut our pie holes. And, uh, well, you know, and, and I... I don't know. I think the producers, uh, a wonderful lot of people uh, on this last season. They, and it's a shame the show didn't get renewed because uh, they really, I think they really, they did it right that, that, that season. And it's a it'll shame. It'll be back, didn't. though. They I canceled it before, uh, yeah, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was gone for a year. I think it'll be back. I think uh, it'll be what back. is the ideal format for stand-up on TV? It's tough to capture. Uh, you know what the ideal format is? I'll tell you what the ideal format is. Uh, I mean, I don't know how old you are. But I remember. 27. I, well, I remember. <laughs> I'm only 28. I remember seeing comics on Ed Sullivan or the Hollywood Palace or any one of a number of variety shows. Jeez, you are old. On primetime network <laughs> television. Hell I, yeah. got, no, I do remember Ed Sullivan. I don't sure remember enough. Hollywood Palace. Yeah. But it was, so it was like, yeah, a bunch of people, well-dressed people standing in a giant theater. Cameras are rolling. Guy strolls out to the middle of the stage. Does bang, bang, bang. Does like a five, six, seven-minute set or whatever. Kills, and then he's booked into the clubs and casinos for the rest of his life. I mean, that was tremendous. Right. You know? I mean, you can't beat that for exposure. Uh, you mentioned well-dressed, and you are Natalie attired. I am. And uh, <laughs> obviously, there's an influence. I appreciate a comic that wears a jacket when they're up on stage. I have a policy when I work, perform in Vegas or on the Strip that I wear a suit. So, uh, and, and preferably a suit that's vintage, you know, from the 60s or 70s. 60s. Not 70s, 60s. So, uh, and I've even, uh, that's even bleeding into my regular performances now, like on a, on a, on a cruise ship or on a, at, a, at a country club or whatever, I will, I will wear a suit now. That's and, the, and did you always dress up? No, no. In fact, I, uh, I'm ashamed to admit that I, I used to, like, you know, I've, I've changed. Every comic struggles with how to dress on stage, how to present himself, 
or herself. And it's it's always it's a constant, uh, you know. It should be at least. <laughs> I've seen some some people where it's not a constant struggle. It's like, dude, it should be a constant struggle. You're <laughs> yeah. not you're not making it with that. Don't wear that on stage. That's just not doing now, it. Now the argument they would give is, hey, it's the material. It doesn't matter what I dress as, yeah. right? But w- uh-huh. what would you say to that? I'd say I'd say no. It's a show, right? I'd say it's a show. Come on, you know, give it some thought. Some of these people that go up on stage and they, you know. They don't give it any thought. I think, well, maybe it would help if you did something else. I mean, I used to wear wacky shit on stage. I went all through all kinds of phases. But it's, it's a thing. It's a constant struggle. Do what you want, though. Like I said, in the book, do what you like. When is that coming out, by the way? <laughs> October 1. It's available on Amazon right now for pre-order. It's called The Comedy Bible. The... Uh, oh shit! I can't even remember the name of the book. <laughs> it's called the Comedy Bible. It's who wrote it? Who is the ghostwriter? <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> the Comedy Bible, the complete resource for the aspiring comedian. Tough to write. Tough to write. Yes, when you agree to write it, sign the contract, and agree to write it, and then subsequently uh, embark on your first cruise ever, and packing all your worldly possessions into boxes and deciding to move to Las Vegas and then driving across the country <laughs> and then moving to Las Vegas and then writing pretty much the, the last four chapters in an ap- empty apartment with two chairs, two tables, two laptops, and virtually nothing else. So, it, yes, it's, it was tough to write. And you and Tracy wrote it together. Same process as oh, when so you yeah, do. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Is it always you that... That get, does the first draft and then you talk about it, or does that switch up too? No, it, it's a funny thing because in this, we used a different method on the, on the book because we, we, the first thing we did when we signed the contract was we went out and bought netbooks. We each had our own little netbook, and we brought those on a cruise with us, and we brought them on the road with us, and we each had our own netbook, and we sort of did a sort of a, we divided the work, and she did a chapter, I did a chapter, she did a chapter, I did a, but then we would each go and review the book uh, together. We go okay. and review each chapter, rather, together. Right. And, uh, you know, make tweaks and changes and whatnot. You're from Philly, right? Uh, no, she's from Philly. I'm from Jersey, right across the river. Oh, you're from Jersey. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, like, how you got into comedy. The young Brian. Like, you say, you, you know, you're not a, you don't have a tortured past. Tortured? No, no, no. I have no tortured past. No, my, my, uh, my, my father was a machinist. My mother was a nurse. I uh, I was the youngest of five uh, children. I, I I always say that I led this like leave it to Beaver life in this suburb of Philadelphia in Jersey, and I was like, hey, everything was cool. And uh, I always say that how do you get into how did you get into comedy? I, I tell them uh, my my wise guy answer is drugs. But the uh, is what drugs drugs okay. The, but the reason <laughs> I say that is because uh, uh, I had never gone on stage before in my life, and not so much as a high school player. Or, grade school play or anything like that but uh, in 1980 I was diagnosed with uh, hyperthyroidism and as a result they gave me a drug to regulate my thyroid and another drug to regulate my heart little did I know that that drug they gave me Inderol for my heart was big on the gray market they call it the black market in New York and LA and other performance uh, capitals because it regulates the heartbeat and it essentially obliterates anxiety and nervousness oh really so I, I, I get diagnosed with this. I start taking Inderol. Nine months later, I find myself on stage in Philadelphia at 1 o'clock in the morning at an open mic night dressed as an eight-foot crayon telling five minutes of crayon jokes. And I wondered why. And then I saw a 60 Minutes report on this Inderol or whatever. And I said, oh, my God, MAO inhibitors, they're called. MAO inhibitors. Oh, the inhibitors, In, right. in case anybody wants them. And uh, He's got some for sale. It's like, ah, oh, that's, that's why I started stand-up. I'm an idiot. But it didn't make you funnier. It just made it, you lose inhibitions. Exactly. And it, it and I'm, thank God it did because, you know, I became a stand-up comic. Are you tr- still on them? No, no, uh, no. In fact, like, like a few years later, some other endocrinologist said that the original doctor made a misdiagnosis and that I was not, in fact, hyperthyroid. <laughs> oh, fate. So I, yeah. That was fate. <laughs> So I was taking these drugs for no apparent reason. Oh, uh, wow. And, and what age were you around then when you started? Uh, let's see. That was, oh, when I started, I was uh, 1981. I was, uh, I was 24. 24. So, yeah, and your, your heroes at that time were the guys you saw on Ed Sullivan, Johnny Carson, right? Yeah, Johnny Carson and, 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 and Alan King and, and Jackie Mason. And, uh, oh, uh, uh, I loved, I loved Jackie Vernon. 
Did you? Yeah. I absolutely loved him. I have his album. Um, I have one of his albums. And I look, I listened to it. I said, oh, my God. I'm, I'm essentially, I'm channeling Jackie Vernon. It's weird. You know, he's just these, like, one and two and uh, three, sh like, liners. And they're very, like, surreal and kind of odd and weird. And, you know, it's like kind of like, that's kind of like me at my core. You know, I've sort of, like, I've deviated from that, straight from that a little bit. But, but at, at, my, at my very center, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a Jackie Vernon Really, man, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, young comics do that a lot, right? Yeah. There's Mitch Hedberg, young comics. Yeah, right? yeah, There's, yeah. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm compared, Brian Regan comics. I'm compared to uh, a Mitch Hedberg once in a while and Stephen Wright, but those guys, I guarantee you, had in whispering in their ear, they, those guys had Jackie Vernon. Seriously? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I guarantee Yeah, yeah, it. you have. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of your act, but I did see you on Last Comic Standing. You have yeah. that great droll delivery. and exactly, uh, exactly. The deadpan thing. Yeah. I mean, you can't beat Jackie Vernon for the deadpan now, thing. Do you ever just lose it on stage sometimes? <laughs> you can't stop <laughs> laughing? No. 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 Well, yeah, once in a while. And I'll tell you what. I, I should build that in and fake it once in a while because the audience really gets a kick out of me, you know, sort of dropping the facade and, and, and genuinely laughing uh, at something that occurs, because you know, because I am this monolithic, this this uh, you know this deadpan thing. They 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 think that's funny when I lose it. You mentioned a couple times that you you've just started doing cruise ships. How do you find that experience? Like I, I know it gets uh, shat on. Yeah, <laughs> and yet time. I think why wouldn't you want to do that? You travel around. Precisely. You can sit in your room and write. You Precisely. can experience exactly. things you wouldn't get to experience. We and wrote, you're putting on shows. We wrote about, uh, geez, must have been about three, 4,000 words, maybe more, on our experience doing the cruise ships. And um, it's, it's the definitive, so you want to do cruise ships article uh, because uh, I did a couple of them for Royal, and I had a bad experience. I did great, but I had a bad experience post performance and um and then when the opportunity we were goaded into it essentially by a contemporary of ours who said that we we should try it we should do it and he gave us the necessary information to try it and we did it and in the run-up to it we reluctantly agreed to do one okay let's do one in december and in the run-up to it we fretted and sweated and and then eventually what we did was we went on this manhattan project to go through every scrap of paper we'd ever written on and every nap cocktail napkin and every note and so you save fish. everything yeah oh yeah oh yeah or yeah. pack rats and then and, and, and we and we we did this giant thing where we crashed it all into a computer and a notepad file and then we rearranged it and tweaked it and and and, and we came out with it because the thing about carnival which was the line we went with was that you had to have a 30 minute set that was clean and then we had to have 30 set 30 minute set that was dirty and then you had to have a five-minute welcome aboard show. So that was 65 minutes of material. Right. So you think, oh, you've been doing it since 81. Why the hell? You? Well, no. Well, you know, John Davidson? I'm not going to do a John Davidson reference in 2011. <laughs> uh, so that's out. You know, all but the people on the cruise lines well, would no, appreciate no, no, it. No, no, no. So you're going on stereotypes. The people <laughs> on the cruise that we found to be, it's just a hugely, it's, 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 a, a very, it's a very demographic. But anyway, we, uh, we went through our material, and we, we, um, we crafted these two sets. And then, eventually, we did a very radical thing. We talked to a friend of ours here in Vegas. We were still living in Jersey. We talked to a friend of ours in Vegas and said, Dude, can we go on stage at your club for a week and work out this cruise thing? And he very graciously said, We'd love to have you in here. Come on in. And for a week, we uh, worked on these things just to put sort of the finishing touches on and work out some things. And then we did the cruise in December, and it worked out extremely well. We were so happy and gratified that we had. It was very uh, a, a great sense of accomplishment to uh, figure out how to do, how to whip this this devil of a thing, uh, which is the cruise ship. And then we did another one in January, and then we did another, you know, a couple more, a couple more, and and now uh, I think we're coming up on our sixth one at the end of this month, and it's going to be great. Now to be clear, you and Tracy work separately, yes. but together. You're not right. a comedy no, team. No, 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 not a team. No, so like we'll go on board, say for a five-day cruise, and uh, she'll have to, oh, she'll, we'll each have to do two uh, family-friendly shows and three R shows, and the R and the, and the family-friendly have to be radically different from each, uh, totally different from each other. But you know, they're all each you know each one of the R's is a repeat performance. You know, so, so just to be clear, we have to have a thirty and a thirty. 
And uh, it, I think it rearranged our brains. It rearranged our DNA as far as comedy is concerned. It, it's sort of like it forced us to reassess everything we've written. It forced us to figure out how to group things together. And it forced us to um, approach performing in a different way, too. So it's been a, it's been a net positive for us, totally. What if uh, you were hired or she was hired and the other one wasn't? Well, what, that what would you do? Like suck. you're, you're, you're uh, yeah. <laughs> would you say no? Like, are you a package? Where, well, we've been a package for a while, but uh, in fact, I did. The, I, I actually did two cruises a while back. I did a, a couple for Royal, and um, I went myself the first one, and then about a year later, I did another one. And they uh, they have a policy where they will uh, they'll pay for your spouse to accompany you. Right. So that was cool. But, you know, she doesn't want to be... If I were to take a bunch of royals, she would go on every one of them with me because she has a life. She's not going to sit there and just be, you know, the comic's girlfriend, as we uh, like to call it, and just hang out <laughs> yeah. on this cruise ship. Uh, it would be nice, and she'd probably do occasionally she'd go with me. But uh, as far as a long-term thing and a constant thing, I, no, I don't think I would, uh, I don't think I would work uh, alone. So you'll be doing more in the future? I would hope so. I yeah. would hope so. I, we're getting it down. We're not, we haven't perfected it. Uh, and we are going to continue to work on it. And fortunately, we have, uh, we have um, uh, uh, friendly stages here in, in, uh, in Las Vegas where we can work things out. So I think we're going to continue to work hard at uh, developing more material for each set and doing it. Yeah, I was going to say, you're situated in a prime spot for cruise ships right in the middle of the desert. Right, <laughs> right in the middle of the desert. In fact, a friend of ours, he said, uh, I would never move to Vegas. And he, he described Vegas as a cruise ship marooned in the desert. So that's a rather dim view, and I don't, I, I, of course I take issue with it. Well, except for you love cruise ships, so it's a perfect it's Vegas. Per- it's perfect. Right? I mean, I've, I've never loved, been on a cruise, but I've, I'd love to go. Oh, you should, you should. I've always loved Las Vegas crowds. They've always been, they've always been more diverse than crowds anywhere else. They've always been more de- demographically, racially, ethnically, all that way. Uh, they've always been, uh, and they've always been... Not the easiest crowds in the world, but not not uh, tough or bad. In other words, it's a trick to play in Las Vegas, and I think uh, I felt better about myself when I when I mastered the art of playing a Vegas crowd. The, the type of comics that you and I watched when we were younger, Vegas, right? It's just, yeah. And so, was it a dream of yours to move here? Why did you make the move from South Jersey to Vegas? And it was just this year, right? Yes, it was. It was February, February seventh. Well, we. <laughs> We reached here on Super Bowl Sunday. Well, we had uh, we had we had about had it with uh, the Philadelphia market, and um, we were um, looking to move somewhere. And uh, what were your what were your final choices? Well, who were, enough, who's in the running? We were looking at like places like Raleigh. Oh, really? Or maybe Texas? Oh, Raleigh. <laughs> oh, oh, Raleigh. No, no, or really? No, oh, Raleigh. Yeah. Damn, I missed that up. So, uh, Austin <laughs> or Florida, right? Maybe, maybe not Austin. Maybe like I don't know. Maybe Houston. Or, really? We, we really hadn't thought it out that much. Um, just somewhere w- with a better climate, and somewhere with uh, you know comedy club or two that was that was you know right up there in the top ten or or, or so in the in the nation. And uh, eventually, we came out of here for the World Series of Comedy uh, in September, which a friend of ours runs. Uh, Joe what was Lowers. that? It's great. It's oh, you should come down for it. It's funny. They have like 200 comics come in, and they're mostly feature acts, and they essentially they vie for the top prize, which is like 35 weeks of feature work in the country, throughout the throughout the U.S. and Canada. In fact, this year they're going to offer them uh, several weeks of work in the U.S., Canada, and England, and maybe Australia. So it's wow. fascinating, and uh, they get a really good crop of comics out for it. And we came uh, courtesy of Joe Heap. He, he uh, flew us out, put us up, and uh, we were there in, in the capacity of Shecky Magazine. And uh, it was great. It was a wonderful week of shows. Everybody had a wonderful time. And we looked at Las Vegas in a different light. We'd always played here since 1993, uh, 1988, but we looked at Vegas in a different light. We said, you know what? I think we should consider uh, working here. And then we came out in, in the following November to work on our cruise sets. We, said, we looked around and found an apartment and said, all right, that's it. We're going to come out here. And that's, uh, that's, that's the name of that tune. And we, we came out here February 7th, packed all our belongings, moved out of our apartment on the 31st of January, drove across the country. 
And you've been working ever since. Uh, I've been uh, uh, working my ass off. Tracy's working her ass off ever since. And it's been nonstop. It's been crazy. Uh, Tony Camacho, the fellow who uh, manages the Tropicana, the Brad Garrett's Comedy Club at the Tropicana, uh, we've known him for 25, 30 years, uh, 25 years, because he used to be on the East Coast. And so he was immediately uh, uh, happy about the fact that we were in town. And uh, as a result, I've worked there now uh, twice. I've done guest sets there. I've been able to work out material there, and um, I've filled in. Tracy's worked there two, two or three times, and she's also filled in here and there. So it's, a, it's been a tremendous uh, boost uh, to our, uh, our, our, our offensive. <laughs> so you hit town, and you immediately have a club where you feel at home, and you feel welcome, and you feel uh, useful. So uh, that's been great. This is my uh, first time here. Oh, get I got out. here uh, really? yesterday. Oh. Yeah, so. yeah. It, it is amazing. <laughs> but do you, do you feel that there's so many shows that you just get lost? No. In fact, the more we're here, the more we realize just how manageable and how small this, this town is geographically and how small, I don't, I don't want to say small, but how uh, it's not overwhelming to us. We, you know, when we worked at, uh, we, we used to work at the Rib. We used to work at ba- Catch at Bally's. We used to think, gee, this is just a, it's a whirlwind of entertainment and there's so many shows. And now we live here and, you know, we go to our Walmart, we can see the strip from our Walmart. It's like, it's there, it's tiny, it's on the horizon, we can see it. So it's, it seems a little more manageable. And we know who's in town. We know who's not in town. We can see who's coming to town. And... We sit there and we go. Okay, we're, we're essentially we're finding out the lay of the land, and where it's 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 been fascinating, I must say. And you feel like you're even more immersed in show business here. I bet. I do. I feel I feel such a connection to show business because I could hop on a Southwest flight and be in L.A. in 45 minutes. In fact, we're going there um, uh, uh, first week of July. We're going to be at the the Comedy Magic Club in Hermosa Beach, and um, we can be in Phoenix in no time. We could be in Reno in no time. Uh, and everybody, this is like every weekend, without fail, there's a little slice of L.A. and New York right here in Las Vegas because comics, you know, you gotta have you got to have comics to stock the improv and the stop. Uh, not, oh, stop's no longer. Uh, the Trop, rather. And uh, the Downtown Club, the Four Queens. There's all kinds of venues where they're having comedians in. And there's comedians opening for big acts on the Strip, and there's this and that. So it's uh, and there's there's about a, a dozen or more of us professionals who've been doing it for 25 years or more or 20 years or more who live right here in Las Vegas. So there's right. a community here. And what about just living in Vegas away from the strip? How's that? That's great. I don't feel disconnected at all because I can get to the strip in 15 minutes uh, if the lights are timed right. And uh, it's it's really weird because it's it's far enough away, but it's close enough. You know what I mean? In other yeah. words, it's, it's great. I don't feel disconnected at all. Well, as our third beer has come, uh, what what's on the horizon for uh, Shecky Magazine and for you and Tracy? I mean, you got the book in October. Right. Well, we got the book in October, and also uh, we've just uh, we've just sort of struck a deal with. Um, this uh, company called Inmoo.com, Inmoo, I-N-M-O-O, Inmoo.com, which is a, uh, a website that allows you to upload your videos, and then they put a... Uh, what a they, concept. They put, yeah, but here's the, here's, <laughs> the, here's the twist. They put a pre-roll ad on the front of it, and they share the revenue with 50-50 with the creator of the video. So uh, what they did was they asked us, essentially they, they, they approached us, uh, to brand their comedy uh, section. So it's an independent film website, and uh, it's got uh, pretty good backing, and it's got a pretty good business plan, and uh, we're going to be essentially the, uh, we're gonna be the brand on com- the, com- excuse me, the comedy one. So if you upload your video to YouTube, nobody's going to share, video, uh, share uh, any kind of revenue with you. Right. But if you upload your video to Inmu, they share the video. They share the revenue video, revenue from the video with you. So it's a good thing. And anyone can do this. It's uh, anyone. Yeah. They of course they vet it. I mean they look at it, right. the quality and whatnot and, 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 and appropriateness. But uh, yeah, they put it up there. Bam. Uh, wow. And then it's up to you to promote it. You can embed it in your site. You can you can send links to anybody. You can promote the heck out of it. And uh, you know if it gets enough hits, you'll get a little. Uh, you know you get a check in the mail. Wow. 
Are you still making movies? <laughs> we haven't made a movie in a while. We've been in disarray as far as that's concerned. Our lives kind of like went on hyper mode uh, March 22 when we auditioned for uh, Last Comic Standing. And then, you know, less than a year later, we ended up moving across the country. So our, uh, our movie thing is a little discombobulated. But best movie of your life, right? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Yeah. Yep. Don't regret it for one second. It's been the best. Well, Brian McKim, thank you for uh, sitting down with me here at Hooters in Las Vegas. Thank you much and, uh, for having was, me, Guy. It was uh, great talking to you, and I'm glad we could hash out our differences. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, wasn't that enjoyable? I hope you... Uh, Liked it as much as I liked it. Well, part of that was being in Las Vegas at Hooters. But I also uh, enjoyed the conversation. It was nice meeting the man. Well, I'd met him years ago, but uh, really getting to talk to Brian McKim from Shecky Magazine and seeing him perform around Vegas. I saw him at Brad Garrett's Comedy Club, saw him at the Dirty Joke Show. And I'll see him again next time I go, because I will be back. And next Sunday night, speaking of Las Vegas, we have another Vegas show. The last one, I do believe, talking to comedian Dave Burley. So uh, listen, won't you? <laughs>